On behalf of uh, my colleague, Professor Matt Waxman, to my left, the director of the Hertog Program of Law and National Security and the Center on Global Governance, I'm really delighted to welcome Congressman Adam Schiff here to Columbia. Uh, I can say that Congressman Schiff is that kind of a person that in recent times needs no introduction. Uh, the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee has been on the news so often, I think we'd have to count the times you haven't been on the news <laughs> in connection with the Russian in the, uh, investigation of uh, the past month or, month or so. But let me take this opportunity to mention some of his many other legislative accomplishments to put his very important work on the Russia investigation in context. He's in his eighth term as a congressman from the 28th district in California. Uh, he has led congressional efforts to counter nuclear proliferation, a bipartisan campaign to protect global freedom of the press, including the David Pearl Freedom of the Press Act. Uh, he's a, as a former federal prosecutor, he's invested great effort and legislative accomplishments in finding better ways to test DNA evidence, especially for the victims of sexual assault. He has supported and helped fund mass transit and co-led a bipartisan effort to internationally protect intellectual property. That's truly a distinguished record altogether. If we didn't even have to mention, but what we will mention is his leadership as the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, now investigating the Russian hacking of the uh, US national election. And more broadly, his efforts to provide a stronger legis legislative framework under the questions of cyber threats to national security and privacy, which is the theme, of course, of his uh, talk this afternoon. The question of whether some members of the Trump campaign were involved in the Russian hacking has become a deeply bipartisan issue. So let me end with two quotes, uh, one from Congressman Schiff himself, who is placing this issue in, I think it's appropriate context, and I quote, we need to know exactly what the Russians did in the United States in order to better protect ourselves in the future, and in order to help protect democracies that are currently under assault, his statement. And in a, in a bipartisan mode, I'll now quote from uh, what I'd have to describe as a backhanded mixed compliment from a very fervent uh, Republican, Ileana Ross Letman, Republican of South Florida, and a fellow member of the House Intelligence Committee, referring to the investigation, she says, and I quote, now we're a little like a Telemundo telenovel. I, that's not altogether a compliment, <laughs> I would say, but it's, uh, that's her description. But soon, here the nice part comes, we will get back to regular programming, and Adam Schiff, has always been an honest broker. Now, in today's Washington, that, that's a pretty good uh, compliment, I would say. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Schiff, who will be speaking for 30 or so minutes on the topic of cyber threats to national security and privacy. And then will be followed by a question and answer session led by my colleague, Professor Matt Waxman, and we'll be wrapping up at about 5.15 and partaking a bit of a reception that we have in the back right there for further, more private conversation. So welcome, Congressman Schiff. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to join you today. And uh, there's so, so much that we could talk about, uh, even within the realm of cyber. Uh, but I thought I would uh, maybe discuss a few things, uh, one of which seems quite quaint now because it's been overtaken by so many other events, uh, but I think it might be particularly interesting uh, to those of you that are uh, here studying the law, and it seems like just a, a few years ago that I was uh, a law student myself, although it now is closer to 25 or 30 years, so I don't know where the time has gone, uh, but uh, I remember mostly fondly uh, my time in law school, uh, and it's always fun to be back on a law school campus. Uh, the, the issue that I was going to start out with that I think seems kind of quaint right now was very front and center, uh, I think, before the whole Russia investigation uh, hit with its full force. Uh, and that was an issue really at the, um, 
uh, intersection of security and privacy. Uh, we had a vigorous debate, as uh, many of you uh, know and followed over the telephone metadata program and how that ought to be restructured and should it be restructured. That, of course, uh, dealt with uh, vast amounts of domestic call data that the government was collecting from the phone companies. Uh, now, it was just uh, uh, numeric data disconnected from any content, so it didn't include the conversations people might be having but rather it was phone numbers connected to other phone numbers, the times of calls, the dates of calls, etc. We managed a very difficult but very bipartisan reform of that program uh, and uh, allowed the telephone companies instead to retain their own data rather than government possession this data. That was a difficult issue, uh, but it was not nearly as difficult as the issue that now seems quaint, uh, and that is the whole issue of encryption. Uh, and, uh, and when we talk about encryption, uh, people often are thinking about two very different things. There is the challenge of dealing with data in motion, and there's the challenge of dealing with data at rest. Uh, in the San Bernardino terrorism case, you might remember there was a confrontation between Apple and the FBI. That dealt with data at rest, data on the phone. Uh, and the fact that the phone manufacturers now can make the pass protection so sophisticated uh, that they can't necessarily even open them uh, for the FBI even with a warrant. Uh, and there was a profound question about whether this was sustainable, whether the government should permit uh, essentially a company to make a phone that it can't open. Uh, and we had, I think, the beginnings of an important debate over whether privacy in the cyber realm is somehow fundamentally different than privacy in the physical realm. That is, if you can get a search warrant uh, by going to court uh, and search someone's home, uh, why should you be precluded from going to that same court to get a search warrant to search that person's house? Uh, and we were, I think, in the midst of the early stages of that debate, uh, as well as a parallel debate over data in motion, and that involves the encryption of data using increasingly sophisticated methods of encryption such that when our intelligence agencies might intercept communications from one terrorist to another, uh, they couldn't decrypt the communications even if they had the help of the, the provider or the pipeline or the app maker. Uh, and we had an analogous issue over whether there ought to be some kind of a mandate that the providers of these services uh, have their own key, not a key the government would hold, but their own key such that if they were given lawful process, uh, they would be able to decrypt or open the device depending on we're talking, whether we're talking about data in motion or data at rest. So this was a, an issue we were just in the midst of debating when it was completely overtaken by events. Uh, now we, we are nowhere near consensus uh, on those issues. Uh, and, and those issues, I think, impact the intelligence community and law enforcement very differently. Uh, they impact law enforcement, I think, most particularly when we think about data at rest. Uh, there are crimes committed every day in the country where probably the best evidence is on a phone. Uh, and you might remember at the time we were having this debate, uh, there was a pregnant woman in Louisiana who was murdered. Uh, the key, it certainly appeared to the identity of the killer, might be on her phone where she kept her diary. Uh, it also might be the most recent contact she had on the phone. Uh, but uh, law enforcement couldn't open the phone. Uh, and that case will be multiplied hundreds if not thousands of times uh, in, uh, in the course of a single year. Now, they may not all be the murder of a pregnant woman, but many of them will be murder cases, others will be rape cases, others will be cases uh, of a less significant or less violent nature. Uh, but that problem is, I think, a, uh, already a very present one and a growing one for law enforcement particularly law, local law enforcement that doesn't have the resources that the FBI does, but even for the FBI, uh, because I think the takeaway uh, for Apple uh, from the confrontation over the uh, San Bernardino case was uh, we need to further um, <coughs> refine our security mechanism so that we can say to the court, we couldn't open this phone even if we wanted to. Uh, and so that begs the question of whether companies should be permitted to make devices that cannot be opened uh, even with court order. Um, the issue of data in motion, I think, more particularly impacts uh, the intelligence agencies uh, that are more focused on trying to intercept 
foreign communications, particularly those involving uh, terrorism, uh, and, and may be unable to decrypt given the sophistication and ready availability of encryption technology. Uh, so those are, I, I think, a couple key issues. Um, they're often conflated together, and I think it makes sense for us to break them apart because the solution to one may not be the same solution to another. Uh, the predominant fear, I think, of creating a solution to the issue of data in motion uh, is that if there is a door, whether you call it a back door as the tech companies would call it, or a front door as the intelligence community would call it, um, if you create that door, does that mean that bad actors can also get through that door? Uh, is that door inherently a vulnerability? That means that hackers can hack into the, uh, those communications. The risk of that, I think, with a, uh, with a device uh, involving data at rest is less of a risk. If a device can be designed such that it would need to be in the possession of the manufacturer physically uh, to be opened. Uh, then I think the prospect of a remote party, power, uh, criminal actor, foreign government uh, being able to uh, break open that device uh, is significantly mitigated. Uh, and, and a lot of this involves issues of mitigation. Uh, how much can the risk um, of providing the government access upon legal process be mitigated? Can it be mitigated? Uh, now the tech sector says no, it can't be mitigated. Uh, but, of course, the tech sector has an economic interest in saying no. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that I've done um, is ask the National Academy of Science to do their own analysis of this. Give us an independent analysis of the encryption issue. What can be done? Uh, what, what can be done to mitigate the risk? Or is there nothing that can sufficiently mitigate the risk? Uh, is this just a new fact of life that we have to deal with? Um, and so we are awaiting the results of the National Academy. I would hope that if nothing more, they can give us a common set of facts uh, that we can use to inform our policy making. Uh, but I can tell you, and I invite your feedback on it, we are far from any consensus about how we ought to handle that issue. Uh, let me turn uh, quickly to uh, uh, other issues uh, involving threats to the country uh, in the cyber realm. Uh, and these fall into a number of different categories that are also often uh, conflated sometimes uh, to the benefit of our adversaries. Um, some time ago, I think, for example, uh, when we were confronting Chinese cyber activity devi de uh, devised to uh, steal American intellectual property, steal research and development, um, or just for the purposes of foreign intelligence gathering, as uh, might have been the case uh, with the major hack of OPM. Um, it was very much in the Chinese interest to try to conflate uh, uh, cyber activity for the purposes of theft with other cyber activity. Uh, but they're, I think, uh, quite different. Uh, you have cyber actors, obviously, who are penetrating our computers and our systems uh, because it derives, and they can derive an economic advantage uh, from it. Uh, and we had negotiations between President Obama and President Xi to try to develop at least one rule of the road that countries won't engage in cyber espionage for the purpose of giving themselves an economic advantage over another. That's one category. Then you have the category of foreign intelligence gathering for the purposes of national <coughs> defense. Uh, it's very hard here, I think, to establish any rule of the road because any of the rule of the road that you might establish will be ignored by a party if it doesn't believe that rule is any longer in its national security interest. Uh, and, uh, and so I think the only rule of the road there is um, you better harden your defenses because uh, any rule of the road is likely to be completely unenforceable. Uh, there are things I think that we can do uh, and must do to protect ourselves from hacking for the purposes of foreign intelligence gathering uh, but it's not something we're ever going to be able to stop or anathemize. Uh, it's something that we're going to have to do our best to mitigate. Uh, then you have uh, hacking for the purposes of preparing the battlefield, uh, where foreign adversaries uh, hack to identify weaknesses in our electric grid or in our financial system or our hydroelectric systems uh, or our military systems uh, so that they, if you know, worse came to worse, uh, could interfere with our battle preparations or could wreak havoc uh, domestically. Uh, so you have those kind of probing cyber actions. Uh, then you have uh, the manipulation of data. 
uh, or the weaponization of data. Uh, we saw the Russians use weaponization of data uh, during the 2016 presidential election. Uh, and one of the questions that we're investigating uh, in our committee is, was this always intended to be a Russian uh, weaponization effort? Or did it become one at a certain point? And if it did, why did it become something different than it started? And, and what I mean by that is, we don't know whether when the Russians infiltrated these computers at the Democratic uh, party headquarters and other computers, whether it was the intention all along that once they got this data that they would publish it, they would weaponize it in an in a effort to influence the outcome of our election, or whether this began, as, uh, as many others have in the past, uh, as an effort just to learn more about us or learn more about people who may become the President of the United States. But at some other point, there was a decision made to take that data and make use of that data to influence outcomes. So that's one of the issues that uh, we're investigating. Um, but that issue of the use of data, the hostile use of data, uh, can take a lot of different forms. Um, one that worries, I think, the war fighters uh, the most is uh, whether um, a cyber penetration, could they have the uh, uh, effect or provide an adversary the opportunity to manipulate data such that our war fighters wouldn't know whether they could trust their own data. Uh, you can imagine what havoc it would wreak if a foreign adversary could get into our defense systems uh, and could mess around with the GPS coordinates that we might be sending to munitions. Uh, or if our warfighters couldn't have full confidence in the, their own data, whether their own data was telling them the facts on the ground. Uh, that, I think, is a preeminent concern uh, of our, um, our military. From a uh, uh, health of our democracy point of view, one of the things that really concerns me is many people thought that the red line uh, for the Russians in the 2016 election was, um, well, they're in the computers, they're publishing the, the data, um, but they're not interfering with the actual vote count. So that must be the red line. Uh, well, uh, there were a number of other steps short of actual interference with the counting of the votes the Russians might have taken. Uh, there were other escalatory steps the Russians might have taken, uh, and they might take the next time uh, that we all, I think, need to be aware of, uh, because the best defense we have to many of these vulnerabilities uh, is a well-informed public. Uh, and one of the things that I was deeply concerned about during the 2016 election, as we saw this unfolding, is that in the midst of the documents the Russians were dumping, that they might also dump forgeries. Uh, and this could be done in a very sophisticated way uh, where you wouldn't even necessarily forge an entire document, but you might take an authentic document surrounded by other authentic documents uh, and simply add additional paragraphs uh, to a real document. Uh, and if you add an additional paragraph to a real document that suggested, for example, that there was some form of illegality going on in the Clinton campaign, uh, to use the example of 2016, you can imagine how devastating that would be. I mean, the whole fact that these emails were being spilled out on a periodic basis uh, was influential enough. Uh, but imagine if, uh, if they had doctored the contents of the documents. And I think as far as we can tell, uh, most if not all the documents that were being dumped were actual documents. But uh, uh, in a closely divided election, in a highly polarized electorate, should you forge a paragraph or two or three suggesting illegality, would there be any opportunity in the last weeks of the campaign for either candidate to disprove that forgery? Particularly if the other paragraphs in the document are true uh, and could be corroborated. And even if you could disprove it, would anybody believe the disproof? Um, so this may be what we look at in the future. Uh, and when we think about what do we do about all this, um, one of the reasons why I think that uh, sharing as much of the information as we can, and obviously a lot we have to do in closed session uh, in our investigation, but sharing as much as we can with the public is important uh, because inoculating ourselves uh, to what our adversaries are doing by informing ourselves of their tactics and their impacts is really the best defense. Uh, we are only going to be able to do so much by improving our cyber defensive capabilities. Cyber is the asymmetric battlefield of all battlefields uh, because 
the offense has all the advantages. You just need to find one vulnerability on offense. On defense, you need to protect against every vulnerability. Uh, we are never going to defend our systems well enough. Uh, if the Russians want to get into your computers, they're going to get into your computers. Uh, and, and so what we can do, I think, that has the most impact uh, is we can uh, create awareness of what our adversaries can do, might do, will do, uh, so that when it happens, we can expose it. Uh, we can create a stigma around it uh, so that it is uh, hurtful to whatever candidate it is, entire, it is intended to help, uh, so that uh, both parties uh, and the public adopt a position of complete and utter rejection uh, of the sources of any stolen material, any foreign intervention in our election. That is the best way, I think, to inoculate ourselves against this kind of interference, which obviously we have seen here which our intelligence communities have concluded we will see again, uh, and which the Europeans uh, right now are experiencing. Uh, and obviously, everything that we learn about what the Russians did here, uh, we need to do our best to share with our European and other allies uh, to help them defend themselves. Uh, but this is part of the brave new world of cyber that we're in. Uh, there are uh, very few uh, deterrents uh, out there. Uh, for this kind of activity, and this is, uh, again, uh, something that uh, I think we have to do our very best to try to confront. Uh, and uh, I often look back at uh, um, one of the earlier uh, foreign interventions, foreign cyber attacks, uh, and uh, ascribe the lack of a stronger response to that as having some responsibility for what followed. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, when North Korea attacked Sony, um, you might remember over a not even very good film called The Interview, um, uh, it was quite clear the North Koreans were responsible. Uh, it was quite terrifying that a nuclear power had a uh, leader of such a thin skin uh, that he would attack an American company over a bad movie, uh, but that is the world we're living in. Um, and after that took place, uh, there was a lot of discussion about what the U.S. response should be, might be, uh, and was in fact. Uh, and there was a lot of speculation about whether the lights that were going out in Pyongyang were going out because we were sending a message to Pyongyang uh, by way of a response. Uh, now, the problem with the lights going out in Pyongyang is that if you're going to uh, bring about a deterrent, and I can't comment on whether that we had anything to do with that, but if you're going to bring about a deterrent, um, it's not very uh, effective if the people you're trying to deter don't even know whether you're doing it. Uh, and the lights were always going out in Pyongyang. Um, and this underscores part of the problem with the asymmetric nature of cyber, and that is we have far better cyber capabilities, obviously, than the North Koreans. We have better cyber capabilities than the Russians. We could do more damage to cyber means than any other country if we wanted to. Uh, but isn't that, is that in our interests? Because while we have the greatest com capabilities, we also have the greatest vulnerabilities. Uh, we are the most wired uh, country uh, on the planet. And so yes, we can turn out the lights in Pyongyang. Uh, we could uh, do a lot worse uh, through cyber means in Pyongyang. Um, but they could do a lot to us with much less capable means. Uh, and therein lies the risk. Now what I was advocating at the time of the North Korean attack uh, because I, I felt strongly then, I feel strongly now, that in the absence of a deterrent, our adversaries feel these cyber attacks are freebies. Uh, they will always have a measure of deniability uh, because our intelligence agencies are never going to want to fully disclose how we know what we know. There's nothing the Russians would like better than for us to prove exactly how we know it was the Russians and not the Chinese and not some 400-pound guy in New Jersey. Um, there's nothing the Russians would like better uh, because it would help them develop even better ways to hide their cyber activities. So obviously we're not going to do that, uh, which means that whether it's the North Koreans or the Iranians or the Russians or the Chinese, there will always be an ability to say it wasn't us. Uh, and we will always have people in the United States of, of good meaning who will say the U.S. government really hasn't proved its case. Uh, and indeed, we saw that play out in North Korea, where initially there was skepticism. Do we really know it's the North Koreans? And, uh, uh, and similarly, even today, you have people questioning the intelligence community and saying, do we really know it's the Russians? And, 
Uh, you tune into Fox and they all think it's a false flag operation of some kind. Um, so there will always be plausible, somewhat plausible, um, maybe even very implausible, but nonetheless some level of deniability uh, that accompanies cyber attacks. So th we have to have, a, I think, a level of deterrence. What I was urging with respect to North Korea at the time was not that we do a cyber tit for tat, which uh, I think exposed us to greater risk than it did perhaps the North Koreans. But sometimes the best response to a cyber attack is a non-cyber response. Uh, and in the case of North Korea, one thing that gets North Korea's attention is information. Uh, when the North fires artillery into South Korea, uh, the South Koreans don't always respond by firing artillery back into the North and risking escalation. What they often respond by doing is um, sending information into the North. And sometimes it's through loudspeakers, and sometimes it's through leaflets. Uh, it's information that tells the North Koreans what a terrible regime they have, what a terrible and unsupreme leader they have, uh, how their leadership is starving their own people to feed a nuclear program that is making them less safe, not more. Uh, this is something the North Koreans hate, uh, because anything that uh, impugns the credibility, the legitimacy of the regime uh, is a danger to the regime. Uh, and so what I was urging at the time was that we have an informational response to what the North Koreans did, such that if the North Koreans thought about attacking another one of our institutions or businesses, they would have to decide, is it worth it to bring about another information war with the United States? Uh, similarly, in the case of the Russian hacking of our elections, uh, what I urged at the time was uh, first that we, uh, we call out the Russians on what they were doing. Uh, and there we met resistance within the Obama administration uh, to do that. Uh, I think there were a number of reasons the administration was reluctant to make attribution, uh, even though the evidence was quite clear of the Russian hand. Uh, I think the administration didn't want to appear to be putting its hand on the scale and tipping the scale in Hillary Clinton's direction. Uh, I think it was very conscious of not wanting to be perceived as uh, trying to uh, interfere in that way. Uh, and I also think there was a concern about uh, a, an escalation with Russia uh, and, and a concern that would play into the narrative that the election was somehow rigged. Uh, now that, that didn't add up for me. Uh, my concern was more that if we didn't respond, if we weren't even willing to call out the Russians on what they were doing, it was likely to encourage the Russians to do more, not less. Uh, and ultimately, Senator Feinstein, uh, who was my ranking counterpart on the Senate Intelligence Committee took the rare step of issuing our own statement of attribution, uh, clearing it with the intelligence community because we were using uh, the information they were providing as the basis for our conclusion, um, but nonetheless making our own attribution in September of last year uh, and doing all we could to prod the administration to make its own attribution, which it did the following month. But, but I also thought it was important that it, the administration not simply issue a statement. Um, that the administration ought to begin engaging in conversations then, not now, about sanctions on Russia um, over its interference in our election, uh, pooling our own uh, efforts with those of the Europeans who were already the subject of similar Russian meddling. Uh, this would have underscored the importance uh, not only to the Russians uh, um, that we placed on the sanctity of our democracy, but to the American people as well. Uh, and I thought it would be far worse if we leveled with the American people after the election and told them then uh, what the Russians were up to, then any risk we would undertake by letting the public know about the Russian intervention before the election. Uh, and uh, one final point I'll, I'll make on this, uh, uh, and that is I, I do think that uh, there's a responsibility um, uh, down, the, down the street uh, in the uh, uh, in the newspaper offices uh, of the New York Times and other publications around the country um, when they do discuss stolen material, uh, as was the case here, that the context always be shared. Um, and I remember having these conversations with reporters and editors uh, during the course of the campaign uh, and trying to make the case, I'm not saying that you should never publish material that has been stolen, even stolen by a foreign government that's meddling in our affairs. But I think it's vital that the context always be shared with the reader. Uh, so uh, there may be things certainly that are stolen that don't rise to the level of public interest and don't merit publication at all. Uh, and I think a lot of what was published in the stolen emails didn't rise to the level worthy of publication. 
Uh, it was more salacious than of any public value. But where stolen information is of such public interest that there, uh, there uh, is a strong case to be made for publication regardless of its origin, I think informing the public uh, of where the material comes from, it's why it's being provided, uh, is important information the reader uh, needs to have. Uh, and then the reader can make their own judgment that I don't care how this material came to, to my attention, um, or I do care a lot about how it came to my attention, and if this is being done by a foreign power with the intent of manipulating uh, our process, then I'm going to I'm going to reject that, uh, and that's going to be a negative, not a positive, uh, in my calculus uh, when I go to the polls. Um, but again, this gets back uh, to uh, a fundamental point uh, I think when it comes to cyber and democracy, and that is the best defense is a, a very well informed populace. Um, I'm struck by something that uh, Barack Obama said when he did his first news conference uh, at, about the cyber hacking. And he was, uh, he was ruminating about how uh, ironic it was that the party of Reagan was willing, at least in part, to embrace the ill-gotten gains provided by the Russians. Uh, and, and he was pointing out that the, the only reason why this attack was successful in the way that it was uh, is that we are so bitterly divided. Uh, we have become so partisan uh, that we are willing to tolerate foreign intervention if it helps our party and hurts the other. Uh, and ultimately, the only way, I think, to, to really protect ourselves is if we can develop a bipartisan consensus that whoever oxes gored by foreign intervention, it will be rejected. Uh, and, uh, and I think had the nominee been Mitt Romney or John McCain, that consensus would have existed. It didn't exist in the last election, uh, where you had one of the candidates willing to, in a very open fashion, say, hey, Russians, if you're listening, hack Hillary Clinton's emails and you'll be richly rewarded. Um, somehow we have to get back to a consensus that that kind of foreign intervention will be rejected no matter who it benefits, because while it benefited Donald Trump in 2016, it may be very disadvantageous to the GOP uh, in the next go-round, uh, but whichever party is uh, on the receiving end of stolen information, um, it is destructive of our democracy and we all ought to reject it. Uh, but these are some of the issues that we're confronting, uh, and just of a cyber nature. Uh, there are a lot of other broader issues uh, to talk about today, uh, in, and I'm more than happy to discuss these issues. We can talk about authorization to use force issues uh, in Syria or elsewhere, North Korea, uh, or really any uh, other issues of interest to you. And I thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you very much. I'd like to kick off the, the discussion before opening it up to uh, especially questions from uh, students, especially my students. Uh, let me first, Some of my uh, students, uh, too. And your students, too. Uh, let me first ask you to amplify a little bit on your uh, uh, comments about uh, Russian election meddling. Um, let, me, let me first get a different mic. Thanks very much. I told you they can hack anything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, I think the way in which uh, different people think about appropriate response depends in part on, on how they characterize the Russian meddling in, in, in the first place. And there are a number of different ways in which Russian meddling has been, has been characterized. Um, some call it a, a cyber attack and sort of lump it in the same category as the OPM, o OPM hack or, or, or the Sony hack, and, and think of it as a, a significant breach of, of cyber defenses, and it's a, it's a, cyber, it's a cyber problem. We need, to, we need to, to, to up our game in terms of cyber defense. Uh, uh, others talk about it as, a, as an act of war, including some of your, your, your colleagues on, on Capitol Hill, talk about it as, as an act of war to which we need to respond as we would a, a, an act of war. Um, others say, actually, this isn't so new. Uh, I, yes, there are ways in which new technology, digital communications, for example, are, are, are uh, allowing for facilitating new tactics. But the idea of great powers meddling in each other's politics, that's, that's not so new. It may be, it may be impolite, um, but it's not so, it's not so new. Um, uh, I'm curious 
how do you think we should we should think about the Russian meddling? In what category should we put it uh, uh, to begin with? Well, that's a great question, um, and you know one of the things that, that I try to do in, in uh, discussing our investigation and what it means uh, is answer the, the fundamental question: Why should people care about this? Um, and what's the what's the broader context of what we're looking at? And I, I think the broader context is this. We're in a, a new war of ideas globally. Uh, it's not communism versus capitalism uh, anymore, but it is authoritarianism uh, and autocracy against democracy and representative government. Uh, and if you look objectively at what's happening around the world right now, you'd have to say the autocrats are on the march. Uh, we saw a march uh, of further progress in the march toward autocracy in Turkey uh, in the referendum uh, just days ago. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, um, efforts, uh, whether they're in Cairo or in Hungary or in Poland, uh, in the party of Marie Le Pen in France, uh, in the opposition to Angela Merkel in Germany, uh, around the globe, uh, in the Philippines and elsewhere, you, you see an erosion of uh, democracy and democratic institutions, uh, and more and more world leaders following the Putin-esque model of authoritarian strongman. And uh, and in a very real respect, I think the, the health uh, and fate of liberal democracy is at risk. Uh, and the rest of the world has always looked to us uh, to be a, a beacon for democracy, to be uh, a country uh, willing to champion human rights and the freedom of religion and expression, freedom of the press. And I think much of the world looks at us right now and wonders whether we are still willing to play that role. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and I view what the Russians did in our election as very much a part of that struggle. Uh, that's how I think we ought to see this. Uh, the reason, uh, there, are, there are several reasons the Russians got involved in our election, and this was fundamentally different than what we have seen of the Russians' interference in our affairs. Now, the Russians have a long history of interference in the United States and spying in the United States, uh, and there's certainly lots of examples of meddling in foreign affairs and foreign governments, and some the U.S. has been guilty uh, of in the past. But um, what made this different here uh, is, uh, in contrast to China, and the president often says, why aren't people talking about China and the OPM hack, and that was really terrible, and why is it only the Russian, Russians who care about? Uh, what the Chinese are involved in is largely foreign intelligence gathering and economic theft. Um, the Chinese haven't weaponized information. What the Russians did was really unprecedented, uh, at least in terms of our own elections. Now, it wasn't unprecedented in terms of what the Russians have done elsewhere. But the Russians decided they were going to be a lot less risk averse in meddling in our affairs than before. Now, why? Uh, why did they do this? Well, they certainly wanted to diminish our democracy. Um, they wanted to hurt Hillary Clinton, and uh, they wanted to help Donald Trump. Uh, and this gave them an opportunity to do all three at the same time. Now, why do they want to undermine our democracy? Why do they care about our democracy? I think at the end of the day, there's only one thing that Putin cares about, and that is the perpetuation of Putin's regime. Anything that's a threat to that uh, is his top priority to meet and confront. Uh, so what's a threat to the, the regime of uh, Vladimir Putin? Uh, popular revolt is a threat. The color revolutions were terrifying to the Kremlin. Uh, in 2011, when you had those mass protests around the flawed Russian elections, that was terrifying to Putin. Uh, he's not going to lose a democratic election because there really aren't democratic elections in Russia. Um, not if Vladimir Putin can have anything to do with it. Not that it would threaten him. Anyone that does become popular enough to become a threat uh, is brought up on bogus charges or ends up dead in the street. Uh, so the real threat to Putin is a popular revolt. Uh, the real threat to Putin is a deteriorating economy that leads to a popular revolt. Uh, and to the degree that Putin can make the case, okay, we're not a democracy. We don't make many bones about it. We're a thugocracy. We're a kleptocracy. But you know something? So is everybody else. And the U.S. are the biggest hypocrites around. They're just the same kind of a corrupt oligarchy that we are. Um, and look at the President of the United States. Look how he is making the case for the Kremlin. When the President of the United States says that my predecessor illegally wiretapped me, the Russians can say, God, that's just what we do. Uh, and here you have the President of the United States saying that Barack Obama uh, is a felon who illegally surveilled him. Uh, bravo. 
Uh, when the president goes on Bill O'Reilly and he's asked by Bill O'Reilly, why can't you criticize Putin? The man's a killer, and his answer is, are we really so different? That, is, that line could not have been written better in the Kremlin because it is precisely the story the Kremlin wants to tell, which is, yes, we're corrupt, but so is everywhere else. Uh, it's just the Americans are a bunch of hypocrites. Uh, and why have a popular revolt if you're not going to get anything different here than you have anywhere else because they're all the same? And so they try to tear down our democracy. They try to tear down the European democracies. Of course, they want to undermine NATO. Uh, they want to undermine the European Union. Uh, having a president of the United States uh, who celebrates Brexit uh, and encourages other nations to leave the European Union, what could be better for the Kremlin than that? Uh, for all these reasons, including Hillary Clinton's uh, acknowledgement of the fraud in the Russian elections and what Putin perceived as her uh, egging on the protesters, there was every reason in Putin's mind for him to throw caution to the winds uh, and become actively engaged as a participant in the American elections. Um, so I view this in the broader context uh, of an effort to really tear down at democratic institutions. Uh, now, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, what's at risk you know, was, was brought home more to me by anything else uh, um, on a trip that I, I took to Munich uh, a couple months ago with John McCain to a national security conference. And, uh, one of the wonderful things about traveling with him is he can invite anybody he wants to dinner. Uh, and he invited Bono to dinner with us. And uh, we were at that point in the evening where we started to tell jokes. And uh, he told a joke about Ireland. And then he got serious for a minute. And he said, uh, um, I'm very proud of my Irish heritage. Uh, but Ireland, like most countries, is just a country. America is also an idea. Uh, and when he said that, it, it really struck me that what's really at risk right now is the whole idea of America. Uh, and uh, I think about those young people who gathered in Tahrir Square, uh, and uh, before their revolution was hijacked by the Islamists, and uh, how much they're at risk. Many of them are in jail, others are facing prosecution, uh, or under home arrest, and how they must wonder, is there anyone still out there championing our cause. Uh, I've yet to hear this president use two words in combination, human and rights. Uh, and so I, I view this all within that context of the continuing necessity, maybe now greater than it's been in my lifetime, that we once again reassert leadership, uh, that we are going to champion uh, democracy. Uh, not democracy at the you know, point of a, a gun, but nonetheless we are going to be the champions of democracy and individual rights. Uh, and, and I think that's how we ought to view any interference in our democratic affairs uh, or the democratic affairs of other nations. Great, thank you. Uh, do you think, going, going back to the issue of cyber conflict, both uh, cyber defense but also the conduct of U.S. offensive cyber operations, do you think we're organized as we need to be going into uh, sort of this, new, this new era of, of, of conflict? You know, after World War II, our government went through a, a radical reorganization in order to, to deal with the demands of uh, global military leadership. Uh, I, after 9-11, we radically restructured the government to deal with terrorism threats. Um, do, do we have the right organizational structure for, for cybersecurity, um, both, as I said, both defensive and offensive, or do we suffer from problems like having expertise uh, distributed to widely throughout the government, uh, a, a mismatch of authorities and, and, and responsibilities among government agencies? Uh, you know, the simple answer is we're probably not structured the way that we should be. Um, and part of the challenge is, uh, is it Moore's Law that has the 18-month uh, changes in technology? Um, if technology is on an 18-month timetable, the government is on a 36 month or 72 month uh, timetable in terms of its reform to keep paces with technology. So we're always going to be chasing this. And, uh, you know, there's one area that we're looking at right now that I think we could make a very uh, significant and important reform. Uh, and that is uh, right now um, the director of the NSA has the responsibility both for 
the NSA's uh, primary focus, but also the cyber command, the military command uh, of our cyber capabilities. Those are two very big jobs uh, housed uh, under the same uh, hat. Uh, I think we would be wise to split up those responsibilities. Uh, they're big enough jobs for two people to do with very different focuses. It would also allow NSA to be led by a civilian instead of necessarily led by a military person each time. So that is one organizational step that we are uh, exploring right now. But, uh, it, but the, the oversight responsibilities in Congress as well as among our agencies for dealing with cyber are diffuse uh, among innumerable agencies, uh, which opens us up to our own vulnerabilities uh, just as it does in the private sector. Uh, one of the analogies uh, I like to use in terms of uh, uh, how that diffuse nature of both our oversight and our defensive capabilities is a vulnerability is the, the hack of target, uh, which you might remember from a couple years ago. Uh, the hackers got the finances, uh, credit information, et cetera, of target customers by going in through the air conditioning. Uh, in the virtual equivalent of the Jewel Heist movies where you climb through the air conditioning vent, uh, in an Internet of Things, uh, you're only as well defended as your most vulnerable port of entry, and here it was their HVAC system, uh, their system that was online that indicated uh, when they should turn their air conditioning on, what the ambient temperature was outside. Having that capability is enormously efficient. You can have uh, in real time a uh, computer decide what are the energy costs uh, at that very moment. Uh, what is the temperature outside, what's the temperature inside, what is the most cost-effective time for us to be changing uh, from heating to cooling or, or whatnot. <coughs> but if it's not well defended, you can get into that system and you can migrate to the system to where the financial data is kept. Uh, the same is true in a whole-of-government approach where you try to be efficient by connecting your cyber systems. Uh, it provides greater efficiency. It also provides a port of entry potentially uh, to very important data. Uh, so the, the tasks are phenomenally expensive uh, and cumbersome and difficult. Uh, and obviously we have to do the most that we can to meet those challenges. Uh, but probably the, the most specific example I can give of a particular reform uh, would be separating off the NSA responsibilities for our foreign intelligence gathering uh, and the cyber command, which has uh, uh, quintessentially a defense and warfighter focus uh, as it should. Thanks. But before I open it up to students, um, can I ask what we should be watching for uh, in terms of uh, surveillance reform? In recent years, we've had several waves of, of, of surveillance reform in, in the wake of uh, disclosures of the Bush administration's terror surveillance program or warrantless wiretapping program. We had a, a, a series of reforms in the wake of the Snowden revelations. Uh, you referred uh, earlier to uh, a reform of, uh, of metadata collection and, and analysis. What are, the, what are the issues we should be looking to, or what, what are the issues we should be watching for the next waves of, or, 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 or successive rounds of surveillance reform? Uh, you know, I guess I would highlight a couple of things. One is the issue that I started out with, and that is, will there be a resurrection of the debate over encryption? Um, you may have seen right after the attack in Britain uh, that the British were talking about imposing a mandate, and I think they're already in discussions with our technology companies about whether they're going to impose a mandate. You want to sell your products, you want to do business uh, in Britain, uh, you're going to need to uh, be willing to comply with British legal process if you do. Uh, this was the outcome of, I think, a frustration on the British part that whatever technologies they may have seized uh, after their recent terrorist attack, uh, they had the same difficulty that we had uh, after the San Bernardino attack in being able to exploit. So that issue may come roaring back. Um, the other issue that it will necessarily be before us uh, during the course of the year is 702, uh, Section 702. Um, we have wisely built sunset dates uh, into most of our surveillance uh, programs so that it forces the Congress to continually reassess, um, is this program working? I think there are a lot of questions we, we off, always have to ask about any surveillance program, beginning with whether it's constitutional, uh, whether it's lawful uh, statutorily, uh, but also is it effective? Uh, and even if both lawful 
and effective is it's structured in a way that minimizes any unnecessary intrusion on our privacy. Um, and we'll be having those debates and those analyses when the sunset comes up on section 702. Now 702 uh, is surveillance that's focused on foreigners for foreign intelligence gathering purposes. Uh, but one of the issues has been raised with if you're focused on a foreigner and you're gathering foreign intelligence uh, and in the uh, course of lawful intelligence of a foreigner, uh, there is communication with an American. Um, under what circumstances can you access that communication with an American? Does that require you to go to court with an individual uh, specific request? Uh, is that something the court can provide for on a more general order so that the agencies uh, don't have to go back to court each time? Uh, in the event uh, there is this uh, gathering of incidental intelligence. Uh, so we will have that debate on Section 702 uh, during the course of the year, and I think that debate is already be being colored uh, by the Russia investigation and by some of the issues that have been raised uh, by the White House, among others. Uh, but those are probably two issues to keep an eye out for. Great. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, why don't I open it up to some uh, uh, questions uh, uh, from from students, should we use mics? Is that is that best? Yes, back there. Unless you want to really shout, I can speak up. Um, so uh, Putin's been in power in Russia for quite a while, uh, and you've spoken to uh, sorry, and you've spoken to uh, things that have heightened tensions between the 2011 protests, um, the collapse of the ruble, uh, and, you know, the Crimean conflict. Uh, is there any question as to Rus Russia using similar capabilities to influence an election before the 2016 election? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, we weren't the first by any means to be the subject of Russian intervention in the cyber realm. Uh, and uh, you, while uh, there are many uh, cases that I can't go into, uh, there are certainly abundant public reports about interference uh, in European countries uh, and other countries by the Russians through cyber means. Uh, the Russians use a, a whole host of techniques of influence. Uh, um, the, the cyber means are just one of them. Uh, they also use uh, financial entanglement as a tactic. Uh, they use business transactions. Uh, they use energy transactions. They use uh, the gathering of compromising material to extort people. Uh, there are a whole host of tactics the Russians have used in Europe. Part of what we're trying to figure out is how many of those tactics did they use here. Um, but uh, what, what made what the Russians did here unprecedented was not that they weaponized data, it's that they weaponized data here, uh, because that's a, a, something that they have done elsewhere. Um, one of the other issues, and this get, gets back to one of the questions you were asking, Matt, um, about the broader challenges that we're facing, um, and this may be among the most difficult, is Part of what the Russians do is to propagate news that's completely uh, erroneous and false and fabricated uh, in an effort to sow confusion and to uh, undermine the whole idea of there being a truth. Uh, and of course we see that in the recent chemical weapons attack by Assad uh, and the Russians' effort to uh, propagate the idea that no, this wasn't Assad gassing his own people, this was uh, a conventional round that landed on a terrorist uh, weapons, chemical weapons cache. Uh, to the degree that they can sow enough doubt about whether anyone really can be believed, uh, that has been in the Russian interest for quite a long time. Um, and how do we combat that? Um, one of the reasons why um, I, I found it so destructive for the president to be suggesting that our intelligence agencies were either incompetent or corrupt, uh, is that he was going to have to rely on them, um, ultimately, and he was going to have to persuade others to rely on him. Uh, and that's exactly what happened uh, when Assad gassed his people recently, uh, is the president had to rely on that intelligence to make a decision to do something. Uh, and then in making the case that, no, this was Assad uh, gassing his own people, uh, he had to make the case that you can't believe Assad and you can't believe the Russians. Uh, and the Russians had an interesting response, which was, are these the same intelligence agencies you just said that we shouldn't believe? Um, and that you ridiculed for doing such a poor job on Iraqi WMD, and now you're asking us to believe them. Uh, and uh, this is why I think that when the president denigrates 
for no reason our intelligence agency does damage to it himself and his own uh, as well as the, our entire country's uh, <coughs> prospects of, of success going forward. But um, part of what, what has made this challenge so great is our media is now very uh, stratified. Uh, people now tune into the news they want to hear. And when I, was, when I was in college, I remember going home to the dormitory early one night because I wanted to hear Walter Cronkite's last broadcast. Um, can any of you think of anyone on TV now that you would go out of your way to be home in time for their last broadcast? Maybe Bill O'Reilly, but for different reasons. Um, and and I, I think that it used to be the case that we would hear opposing views or news was less opinionated uh, and we were, we were exposed to at least a common set of facts and we could have different opinions about what we ought to do. Now there are no common facts, it feels like, and conservatives watch Fox and liberals watch MSNBC and those who aren't sure watch CNN. Uh, and, and that has just multiplied by people now, the democratization of information, being able to go online and pick the particular niche they want to live in. And if they want to live in the pizza gate, there's a child predatory sex ring under uh, this pizza parlor in Washington, they can live in that conspiracy-laden circle um, and never have to come up for air. Uh, and, and, and this is a very pernicious problem to fight. Uh, in, in, a, in a place where we celebrate the First Amendment, we can't restrict people from saying things even when they're nonsense. Um, but we have become so polarized that we made ourselves vulnerable to this incredible misinformation. Um, I used to marvel when I traveled around the world at how people believed these crazy conspiracy theories. And, and I remember going to Pakistan once and people um, in the press were writing that I was John Negroponte. And uh, I don't have as much hair as I used to, but I have more than he does. Um, and I was there to persuade the Musharraf at the time to do something with the Pakistani Supreme Court, either reinstate it or unseat it or something. And, uh, um, this was just one of these rampant conspiracy theories about my visit, uh, and it was laughable, and now I don't laugh anymore, because um, you asked a big segment of the population whether they believe Al-Qaeda was responsible for 9-11, and uh, you know, happily the vast, vast majority of people do, but there's a sizable group of people now that don't, uh, and, uh, and that have platforms online and spout this stuff. Uh, and, and that's a very pernicious problem for us to deal with. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. Okay. Well, I'll take it. So, uh, oh, no, I, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Jeff Stein. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming to speak today. Um, I have a couple of political questions and then uh, one legal question. So, Three okay. questions? <laughs> I'll, I'll make them very Can you hand the mic to the gentleman behind you? <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is about the use of the phrase um, the Russian hacking of the election. I heard you say that today, and I've heard many other people say that. And um, us being here at law school, uh, we're, we're taught textualism. And I would think that phrase textually the core of that phrase would mean that the Russians hacked the election, like the, the actual uh, outcomes of, of the votes. And you uh, earlier said that that's not something that has been found. So I, I wonder if you find that the common usage of that phrase um, at all problematic. Um, I'm also kind of worried about um, the level of vitriol about um, US-Russian relations, and I'm just wondering if you could maybe comment on that, if that's something that you're at all scared about, because um, these are the two uh, largest nuclear arsenals in the world, and um, the fact that tensions seem to be rising, and especially in our political climate, um, the tension seems to be rising. Is that something that concerns you? The legal question is about um, the Communications Decency Act, Section 230. Um, courts so far have found that act to be um, a shield um, for civil liability um, for social media companies like Twitter or Facebook in terms of um, 
liability for material support of terrorism cases. I was wondering if you think that um, that it, Section 230 should continue to be uh, a, sh a complete shield for liability, and if courts continue to find it to be a complete shield, do you think that there should be um, statutes uh, to, to change that? First? Well, I apologize for the no, no, I, I'm, I'm going to go with the first two because I'm not in the weeds enough on the third, I think, to give you an answer I'd be comfortable with. Um, but let me at least uh, go to the first two. Um, in terms of describing this as the Russian hacking of our election, uh, I think it's a fairly good shorthand, but it is only a shorthand uh, to describe what the Russians did. Uh, I, I'm certainly not suggesting that they hacked the actual vote counting machines, uh, although they had certainly been public reports of them hacking voting databases. Um, but this isn't simply the Russians hacking the DNC. Uh, if we describe it as the Russians hacking the Democratic Party headquarters, uh, that I think simply connotes they're going to a particular institution uh, and not going any further than that. Uh, the, the real gravamen of what the Russians did is that they published this data, they weaponized this data with an intent to influence the election outcome. Uh, now. The fact that the intelligence communities cannot conclude, it's not their mission, that this was determinative, uh, and that we will never be able to say in a close election of this nature that but for doing this, the result would have been different, we're not gonna ever be able to say that definitively, uh, doesn't, I think, minimize what the Russians did. What the Russians did was certainly influential in our election, uh, and, uh, and so I think the shorthand of the Russian hacking of the election is a far more accurate descriptor than any other that I can come up with. Uh, but I, I'll be the first to concede, I don't mean to suggest by that actually impacting the tally. One final point I'll make on this is, I think what the Russians did was far more effective than if they had tried to alter the vote count. Uh, because with our, and not by particular design, but with our very uh, disaggregated election system affecting enough of the voting machines would be very difficult. Uh, it's far more efficient to try to affect public opinion uh, and influence the outcome that way than hack a particular machine, uh, election machine. So I do think it's an accurate uh, uh, generalization and more accurate than, than uh, anything else that I could come up with. Uh, in terms of whether I'm concerned about the heightened tensions with Russia given um, our nuclear capabilities. Um, certainly, uh, I'm concerned about it. I, I don't think having a, um, uh, a dramatically negative relationship with Russia is good for the world. Um, but this isn't a situation where we have that relationship because, uh, as I think President Trump used to um, attribute to his predecessor, uh, Barack Obama wasn't respected by the Russians and that's why we had a poor relationship or, um, or President Obama wasn't treating the Russians the right way. The reason we have a poor relationship with the Russians is they view their interests fundamentally different than ours. Uh, and as long as Vladimir Putin is there, that is likely to be the case. The Russians view the world as a zero-sum game. What's good for them uh, is bad for us. What's good for us is bad for them. Um, it is not in our interest that they remake the map of Europe by dint of military force. It's not in our interest for them to bomb civilians in Syria or to prop up the Assad regime. Uh, it's not in our interest for them to uh, degrade uh, NATO's capabilities or undermine the European Union uh, or take action that would exacerbate refugee flows and further destabilize Europe. None of that is in our interest. Uh, and speaking nicely of Putin or avoiding saying harsh words about Putin uh, or being unwilling to confront Putin on his meddling in our affairs and the affairs of others. Um, that may not lead to a, a positive relationship, but it is fundamentally necessary. Uh, I, I think that the mistake that the Obama administration made uh, was not in uh, uh, confronting the Russians too strongly, but not confronting them strongly enough. Um, I think we should have provided defensive weapons to Ukraine uh, when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, we committed to Ukraine when they gave up their nuclear weapons uh, back in 1994 in the Budapest Memorandum that we would do what we could to assure their territorial integrity. And I don't think we lived up uh, to the assurances that we gave. Now, ironically, the Russians also gave their assurance. 
Uh, but nonetheless, um, my greater worry with the Russians has been the lack of a response is perceived by them as an open door. Uh, and I'm more worried about our failure to have a strong response in Ukraine encouraging further Russian adventurism than I am having too strong a, a, a response uh, encouraging some kind of uh, escalation or confrontation. Okay, let me stay there with uh, Caitlin. Thank you for coming. Um, going off of Professor Waxman's question regarding whether or not we're organized to meet the cybersecurity threat, um, I was wondering how you're thinking about changing the ways that the government actually recruits employees in order to recruit more tech people. I mean, first and foremost, one of the biggest impediments is just starting salaries. Like for first years, I have friends in tech in California, friends in tech in DC, and there's no way the rational ones in California are ever going to move to go work for the government. And I see that as a huge structural impediment. Also, just like the availability of resources, especially at the younger levels, and freedom and authorities to actually have a real, like, impactful difference. So, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. This is a, a phenomenal challenge, um, and the reality is that uh, these agencies are never going to be able to compete financially with the Silicon Valley. When I go out to uh, Apple and Google, uh, it's like being back in college again. Uh, their campuses are beautiful. Uh, they've got sushi for lunch. Um, they've got places for yoga. I mean, it, it's just they have you know bikes available, and they've got vans to pick you up and take you home. It's you know, you don't have to grow up. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I don't know why anyone would leave or go anywhere else. Um, uh, we are lucky that there are still a lot of people who are driven to join the intelligence agencies out of a, a deep sense of patriotism, that they feel that they can make a real contribution in a different way. The people in Silicon Valley make an enormous contribution uh, in, in their work, and a lot of them actually um, uh, are also very important uh, in terms of the work they do and the intelligence community. But there are people who are driven to join NSA and join CIA and join the other agencies because they feel they can make a different kind of a contribution and are willing to take less pay for it. Um, it's been a lot harder, I think, post Snowden uh, and with the questions that have been raised about what the IC is doing. And, and I think that issue has been probably more difficult than the pay issue. Uh, and that is, do, do people feel uh, somehow stigmatized in working for the intelligence agencies in the technology arena? Uh, and, and that's something that we really have to confront. Uh, um, because, uh, you know, I, I think that, and, and our bread and butter is overseeing these agencies uh, every day. Um, the people I come into contact with are, are quite brilliant people. Uh, they're doing their work for the right reason. Uh, they're operating under a legal regime that the Congress has established. They're not making the laws. Uh, and if the, the public doesn't like the laws, it's our job in Congress to change them. Uh, but, but they're doing their job and, by and large, doing it uh, phenomenally well. But we are always going to have that challenge. And, uh, and I think that challenge has gotten that much greater in the, in the kind of post-Snowden environment that we're working in. We've got uh, time for one last question. I'll, I'll, I'll give my mic up to, to Papa. Thank you. Uh, so I had, a, uh, I had another question about uh, response to cyber attack. So you mentioned condemnation and some sort of informational response. So I have two questions on that. First, um, if the U.S. or when Senator Feinstein issued for condemnation, do you think the main audience for that is the American people? So it was suggesting this is not normal, this is not the way that politics should be conducted, or is the main audience supposed to be Russia and Putin? So you're like, this is, this is a response, we know you're doing this, don't do it again. Um, and then the second question about informational response. Um, what, is, what does that look like, especially um, in Russia, where the majority of the population gets its news uh, from TV that is fully controlled by the well, um, Senator Feinstein and I issued that statement uh, jointly uh, as a way of uh, uh, making a very public attribution of what the Russians were doing. Um, we, you know, were encouraging the administration to do it. They were not prepared to do it, uh, so we took the step of issuing our own attribution. Attribution, I think, is the very first step you take uh, in the event of a cyber attack. 
because sometimes attribution itself can have a deterrent impact. Uh, when you're exposing what a foreign adversary is doing uh, and you're holding them up to condemnation, uh, that alone can be a deterrent. They know they're discovered. They know you're willing to call them on it. Uh, but I think that's seldom going to be a sufficient deterrent. And I use the, the uh, uh, example of information in the case of North Korea because I think that's an, an appropriate response to North Korea and something that uh, would deter them. Uh, but in the case of Russia, I'm not sure that information is the response that I would recommend. Um, to me, it's quite incredible, uh, and I continue when I meet with Russia scholars uh, and I talk to people like uh, Ambassador uh, McFall, who I think is just brilliant. Um, I, I continue to try to understand why things have changed so dramatically in Russia. Because the Soviets used to publish nonsense Soviet propaganda all the time, and nobody believed it. It was a joke. Um, but people are quite credulous, quite willing to believe what the Russian state media has to say. Why have the Russians lost their skepticism uh, about the information they're getting? I, I'm still trying to understand that. Uh, but in any event, what I, what I was urging in the case of Russia was not necessarily, it's really not a cyber attack on Russian democracy. It's got its own problems without us helping. Um, but rather uh, economic sanctions. Because um, what the Russians care the most about right now is getting relief from the sanctions over Ukraine. Uh, now, we ultimately did impose some economic sanctions over the hacking. But compared to the economic sanctions over Ukraine, they were very minor. Uh, and because Putin fears a uh, uh, degradation of the economy and popular unrest, that gets the Kremlin's attention. Uh, that's their number one priority is relief from those sanctions. So when they take steps like they did in hacking uh, our election, for lack of a better term, um, I think the best response is one that is going to be felt the most uh, punitively by the Kremlin and that would be additional sanctions. And so that's what I was suggesting in terms of our, our course on Russia. Could, could I ask a follow-up on that? Yes, I'd like to, on, this, on the same question, which I think is very interesting, uh, some people at the time suggested that we should publish what we know from the Panama Papers and other sources about the operation of the Russian economy, and particularly the links between Mr. Putin and some of the oligarchs associated with him. And we have found that the Russians actually are very concerned about corruption within their own country. And in the past few weeks, they had demonstrations of that effect. Uh, but we apparently chose not to do so. Should we have uh, published uh, that kind of information publicly, or would that have been counterproductive? Well, I think it's a very good question, and I think it's a very tough call. Uh, on, on the one hand, it's very tempting to want to put out information about uh, corruption uh, in the Putin regime and among the oligarchs and their hidden wealth and their stolen wealth uh, while many Russians are living uh, from hand to mouth. Uh, at the same time, when the response to stolen information and publication is for us to steal information and publish it, uh, it does blur the lines about who is doing what and open us up to criticism that we're doing just what the Russians have done. Um, so uh, I think that's a very difficult and close call to make. Um, it, uh, I think, would probably have, you know, it, it's certainly something the Russians would not like to see happen. I think it would probably have less of a deterrent impact than a stronger second round of sanctions would have, and it wouldn't open us up to the criticism that we're doing uh, just what they deplore or, uh, or escalating in terms of further Russian hacking and further publication of information about U.S. persons. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to join us.